right, everyone. We appreciate you guys joining us. At I forgot to take my mask. <laughs> All right, everyone, we appreciate you guys joining us today. We are having a, a roundtable kitchen discussion at my dear friend, Suzanne Guy, and, and her daughter, Rachel Guy, and I've got my beautiful wife, Bailey, with me today. Um, as many people that have been following my campaign know, uh, the pro-life issue is something that is a top issue for me. Early in my campaign, I was the first candidate in this race that was endorsed by GLA or certified by GLA. My opponent, then Luce McBath, uh, attacked me pretty viciously, continued to do it, uh, but it's an issue that I'm uncompromising on. And I thought uh, we needed to have this discussion because I think it's one of the leading issues of our time that I don't think people are talking about enough. And, and as Bailey and I were talking and praying and deciding who would be best, we thought none other than, than you two. Uh, so we appreciate you guys joining us today. Thank you um, for having us so much. You guys are true advocates and are making a true, true change, and that means a great mm -hmm. deal to us. Um, first, I'll tell you one of the main reasons why I'm pro-life, and I'd love to hear you guys as well. So I grew up a proud Christian. My granddad was a Southern Baptist preacher. Uh, so it, to me, it's a moral issue. But I'm also an only child. Uh, <laughs> like Rachel. Well. There you go. <laughs> Many people don't know that. Bailey and I on our first date, actually. <laughs> Uh, I knew I, this was going to come I, out. I told, ah. her, told her many, many stories about me, and, this, and, and I went through all the things that I am, and I told her I'm an only child. At that point, her jaw, jaw just about hit the floor. <laughs> oh, uh, no. This is a bad thing to you. <laughs> right. I grew up with a family of, like, five kids, so and I have a lot of extended stepbrothers, stepsisters, so it's, like, a, it's a very large family. So when he told me that, I was like, oh, Dear Lord, you can be overwhelmed. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, but my, my mother actually had complications with my birth, and as a result, she couldn't have any more children. So, I had no brothers and sisters, and so I learned the fragility of human life, and that's one of the things that drove it home uh, for me. And so, I've, I feel a moral obligation to make it front and center in my campaign. But I'd love to hear your story, and Suzanne, I think you uh, tell it as well as anybody. I know Rachel obviously knows it too. So, look. Go ahead. Oh, well, thank you. And can I say just um, it's such a privilege to be with you and Bailey. And I cannot overemphasize how much it means that you both not only have God's heart for life, but that you are so bold and vocal and uncompromising about it because that's huge and, and that is essential because it truly is the heart of God. We are all made in the image of Almighty God. Um, but like you, and I didn't even realize that piece of your yeah. story, um, like you, um, we do have a story as well. I believe everybody has a story of some sort or another. But um, my husband and I, Peter, had struggled with many years with infertility. Never even thought that would be a part of our journey. And, and I would like to say to everybody that's watching, if that's your experience, that God sees you and he cares and he has a plan. Um, but one day, you know, I, I would keep going to the drugstore to get the pregnancy test, just thinking, one of these days, one of these days. And God had really brought me to a place of surrender, mm -hmm. but still praying that one day he would bless us with children. And um, one day we got, you know, the great news that I was pregnant and we were so excited and, and I was, you know, telling everybody with a pulse that I was pregnant. <laughs> and um, because of our journey, mm -hmm. Um, you know, we were told, you know, Suzanne, you really need to take some advice from the doctor you're seeing about getting into the hands of the best doctor, the best practice, best mm -hmm. hospital, just because you and Peter have had so much trouble getting pregnant. We never thought to question it. So we did take the advice and got into the hands of this practice. Mm -hmm. There were red flags along the way, but we were not prepared for what was about to happen. And, um, at one of my visits, I had gone in and half my amniotic fluid was gone at 22 weeks. The doctor, you know, came flying into the room where I was having the ultrasound saying, you must get an abortion, you're going to die, your baby will die, all sorts of craziness. Um, at the time, I was by myself, my husband was on a business trip, and I said, no, I was in utter shock. And um, she said, fine, come back in two weeks, and at 24 weeks, my husband was with me. And he got to experience what I did, but this time all my amniotic fluid was gone. And so this particular doctor was really pushing abortion. When we refused, we were sent to another doctor in the practice who really pushed abortion and said many tragic things. Like, you know, you know what, 
you'll, you'll have other children, to which I said, we don't care if we have a hundred other children, this life matters. Mm -hmm. But he just kept going and going, and my husband finally said, you know, clearly we're not going to abort, what will you do for us? And he said, in all his years of practice, nobody in our position has ever not aborted. Wow. And all we could think of were all those precious parents in a vulnerable position, mm -hmm. thinking that the one they trusted, the doctor, could be listened to, and all those lives lost. And um, one of the other doctors in the practice said the only test they'd give us would be an autopsy. And um, we just knew every step of the way, even if everything they said was true, which it wasn't, but even if everything they said was true, she was still a valuable human being that mm -hmm. had not mm -hmm. lost her value just because of a prenatal diagnosis. And we got into the hands of doctors. I didn't know there was such a thing as pro-life and not pro-life doctors, yeah. but we got into the hands of pro-life doctors who fought for her. And at 26 weeks, one pound, two ounces, she was born. And um, it was a bit of a rough road, but um, the picture of health today, but as I said before, even if everything they had said was true, mm -hmm. she had not lost mm -hmm. her value, mm -hmm. still made in the image of God, and still a priceless gift. Mm -hmm. And then in my next question, I, I feel as though we're getting far more in a more secular c culture where mm -hmm. people are becoming less yes, and less yeah. Christian. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's also a normalization of abortion, mm -hmm. I think. So, Suzanne, you making this issue what it is, how do we fight against that normalization in a more secular, less Christian world? You know what, that is an outstanding question and that is very much happening. And I think there absolutely is a case still to be made scientifically and, and not from a biblical perspective. Of course, that's where we come from, but there's absolutely a case to be made. You know, one of the things is scientifically, you know, when ultrasounds came out, we got a window to the womb. Mm -hmm. We got to see that heartbeat that mm -hmm. starts beating at day 18 and, yeah. you know, 18, 19, 20, mm -hmm. 21. And scientifically, doctors will tell you from the moment of conception, a unique individual who will, has, was never made before and will never be made again. So scientifically, we can make the case. But another part of the argument that is not always talked about in secular circles that is so important, mm -hmm. and this is a huge part of the life issue, is to love men and women well, mm -hmm. is to be very honest that when people choose abortion, mm -hmm. they end up with regrets. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe not immediately, but the number of post-abortion healing groups that are out there, and there are some that are Biblically, biblically based, most are, but not all. But it just shows you that science backs up that that's a unique individual, their own set of mm -hmm. DNA will never be made again. Yeah. But also, what abortion does to a woman and a man, that the effects are lifelong effects. Mm -hmm. We work with a lot of people who have had a, an abortion experience, mm -hmm. and the level of Pain is unspeakable. Praise God, they get hope and healing, and they usually are the ones leading the charge mm -hmm. in the pro-life work because they're here to say, I regret my abortion. There's a better way. There's a different way that you can live without regrets. But that's a very important piece of the puzzle because truly, sanctity of life and pro-life is as much about that precious mom and dad yeah. who feel like that's their only choice that need to see that they do have other options and they can pick options that will not lead to regret as well as the acknowledgement scientifically that that is a unique human being mm -hmm. that is growing. Mm -hmm. You only grow if you're alive, yeah. Yeah. you sure. know? Yeah. No, that's right. I, and I'm a firm believer life begins at conception and that abortion is a murder of an innocent human being. Yeah. Yes. And Rachel, I think you're the manifestation of that, and you have a great story to tell. How are you using that story in order to further this pro-life message? Goodness. Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll kind of start when I was 14 years old. Um, so I feel like that's really when my story, just kind of just being involved, feeling led to get involved in the pro-life movement started. Um, so when I was 14 years old, the Lord had burdened my heart to write to the doctors that didn't fight for me. I didn't know what I would say. I didn't know how long the letter would be, but I knew was asking me to write and I wanted to be faithful to that and so five and a half months later six months later he gives me a letter and he gives me three main points first 
He wanted me to share the gospel with them because he wanted them to know that there was forgiveness in him. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted me to share um, that I forgave him because I do, and I can only do that through our Lord. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I asked him to use their power to fight for life and not to harm life. Mm -hmm. And I had sent the letter off, um, hopeful that at that time frame that they had become believers, but also no expectation to get a response back. And to my surprise, I go to the mailbox one day about uh, two weeks later, and I get a handwritten note from one of the doctors saying um, that he didn't think that I would live, that he's thankful that I was alive, and that he would like to meet me one day. Wow. And I haven't met him yet. Yeah. Um, and then another one of the physicians, she also wrote me a handwritten note also saying she's thankful that I was alive. But that really was kind of the genesis of what started the pro-life just movement just in my heart. Um, and then just over the years, I would just end up doing just a lot of pro-life research, just learning about stories, Mm -hmm. um, really just learning just about the reality of the abortion industry just even more so in depth um, and then with that the Lord really just brought about just different organizations and just ministries just to be involved with 40 days for um, life yes and so for example so 40 days for life and that's an incredible organization where it's all about having the grassroots heart of Jesus standing outside of an abortion clinic praying holding kind signs to say such as we care we can help we are here for you um, so it's really reaching out to these girls, preparing baby showers for them, mm -hmm. um, walking alongside of them, showing them that we love them and their babies so much that we're here to walk alongside of them forever. Um, um, and then we also serve at a local pregnancy crisis center together. Um, uh, and then also just the, just over the years, kind of just recently, just getting just more involved just in the political realm. Mm -hmm. um, I testified for the heartbeat bill yeah, in the yeah. House and in the Senate. Um, but like that's just... A, just kind of like, like a bit of the journey, but I think what is so beautiful um, is the fact that there are so many ways to get involved in pro-life. Mm -hmm. And I think, I've often thought that being involved in pro-life, I think that it's a loving command of our Lord. Mm -hmm. Just in summary of Proverbs, of Proverbs 31, 8, where God's saying, be a voice for the voiceless. And he's not saying, be a voice for the voiceless, if this or this. He's simply saying, be a voice mm -hmm. for the voiceless. So I think it's that biblical, godly, loving requirement of us to realize that um, really that as believers that we can, that we should be a voice for the babies, for these women, and for these men. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's be it's a great story, too. I love hearing it every time. Um, you know, my next question kind of comes from me, and there's a lot of men out there who are very proudly pro-life. I'm one of those men that's very vocal on this issue. And Thank made it you front for center. that. Yes. Uh, but a lot of folks say, oh, how dare another white guy tell a woman what to do with their body? Uh, and so I would love, and, and babe, you can uh, tell me too, you know, how, how as a man, not just for me, but any man who's proudly pro-life, how do you uh, voice uh, what we need to do to make sure that in a world that is changing very quickly, we're protecting the sanctity of human life with, without disrespecting women and, and, and their choices? Well, I would say, um, just statistically speaking, that so many women that they have abortions because they feel pressured by someone and oftentimes that's the boyfriend. And so I think that the importance of having men involved in pro-life is, is that it's showing these women who feel like they're backed into a corner by their boyfriend, by mm -hmm. that man, that there is a man who will stand up for her and for her baby, and that there is a man who, who will walk alongside of her and that she's not alone. So I think that the, the voice of the men is missing um, <coughs> because men have been told to be silent, but I think that it's so vital to have men in the fight. Mm -hmm. um, because men also, well, when I think about the beautiful family unit, I think to myself it is God and then it is the husband and then the wife. And God has truly put the covering and he, he has used the husband to be the covering. And I think to myself, what a beautiful, um, just testament to the Lord and to his love when you see the man standing up and being that voice for these precious women who are standing outside of the abortion clinic. I think about a story. Um, just recently, actually, that there was a young woman who she chose life for her baby outside of a Planned Parenthood um, in Marietta. Mm -hmm. um, and there were two amazing people who were standing outside of that abortion clinic um, who are a part of the 40 Days for Life team. What was expressed to me um, is that this young woman, she ran to the guy that was standing outside of the abortion wow. clinic first to talk wow. to him and to share her story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is such a need for the presence of men, and I think that mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking that our that the society that we live in is 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 trying to crush 
the men's voices. Um, something else I think that is, is I think of all of these men who they want their girlfriends to choose life and they're begging them to choose life and the girlfriend is saying, no, I'm going to do it anyway. And I think to myself, when pro-life men stand up, those men who truly, all they could do was speak life, but they couldn't do anything else, and they feel hurt as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Suzanne, do you have anything to add? You know what, I love what you said, and, and I would add this. I think it is such a false narrative to mm -hmm. say, yeah. you are excluded from a seat at the table and a voice at the table yes. because you don't fit a certain, um, you know, gender, a yeah. certain, yeah. Would, would we have said that, you know, during slavery, during the civil rights era, sorry, you can't help our black brothers and sisters because mm -hmm. you're a white woman or you're a white male. This is the greatest human rights violation yeah. of our time. Over 2,300 children mm -hmm. are robbed of their lives every day and men and women are hurt. Everybody mm -hmm. should be engaged. Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't matter your gender, your age, your color. This is a yeah. human rights violation. And just like with all human rights violations, mm -hmm. the Holocaust, slavery, no one should say I'm excluded from trying to fight for what is right because mm -hmm. I don't fit a certain yeah. image. Mm -hmm. We are all called to take a stand when a people group is being targeted for extermination simply because of their location. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everyone is called to have all hands on deck. What a crime if some people say, well, no, you can't be involved in trying to fight the good fight because you don't fit the narrative that we put out there. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. It's, yeah. it's a false narrative. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Babe, absolutely. Do, you, do you have anything to add? Well, I would just say, at least for me, um, and I'm different than everybody, but for me, I always look to Jake, and I would say that, you know, in the, in the normal structure of family, as you mentioned, you always have the male and the female, and most importantly, the, fe the, the male is supposed to be the protector. Yes, exactly. They're supposed to be the person who, you know, when you're having a bad day or something goes wrong, they're there to lift you up. And to also be your support system to protect you to guide you and so for me it doesn't surprise me that the female went and ran to the male outside the abortion clinic because she it's it's an inherent you know just just thing and in, in, in women we just run to our protector which would be a male and so um, for me I think it's very admirable for men to stand up and to fight for the pro-life issue. I love that you mm -hmm. said that. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. No, I think that that's great. I mean, I think we're, we're at a time in our country where with this woke culture, they're mm -hmm. attacking exactly what you just said, Suzanne, and, and they're attacking the nuclear family. They're mm -hmm. attacking religion, unfortunately, mostly Christianity. And we've got to have fighters who are bold and going to stand up in the face of uh, those wokeism. That's mm -hmm. and we that, thank you for being yeah, that fighter. That's it. that's, that's <laughs> yeah. what I'm I'm all about, and that's what we're fighting for. Uh, so he, here's a practical question, which is if we've got an everyday voter, a person in the sixth district, and they want to help, they they want to. I think one way is kind of what you just said, Rachel and Suzanne, which is join these women groups, a support system, to make sure that even if it's a fatherless home that mm -hmm. a woman has the confidence to take the, the, the child. And what Bailey just said, which is we need stronger men. Yeah. Yes. We need men that are going to step up and be responsible and that, that are not going to um, leave a, a, a impregnated woman and not uh, be with them to support. But what else can folks do outside of the obvious things to make sure that they're, everyone's using their platform to spread the word of pro-life? You know, I will say... Um, something that's really important to us which is why we really value what you and Bailey are doing is it is so important that every person engages politically on the life right. issue mm -hmm. it's essential yes and Rachel can speak to what what she was sharing we want to reach hearts and minds mm -hmm. we want to help women and men in tangible ways who often don't even want to have mm -hmm. an abortion but think it's their only choice so we want to be on the front lines loving them well doing a better job saying hey if it's a financial issue we'll come alongside of you we have resources we can help you get housing get your rent paid but honestly i i will go back to other human rights issues mm -hmm. like slavery 
it has to be impacted on a political level. Yeah, and this is why it is essential for all people who call themselves people who care about the sanctity of life mm -hmm. issue yeah. to do everything in their power to get to know their legislators, know where people stand on the issues, mm -hmm. only support people who don't yes. just say that they're pro-life, mm -hmm. but really are vocal the way that you are. You've mm -hmm. got it on your mailers. You are, you are out there being very vocal, showing mm -hmm that this is such a priority. And it's so important for people to engage that way with their legislators because mm -hmm. we must make abortion illegal. Mm -hmm. We must make it unthinkable too. And that's the heart and minds component, reaching hearts and minds mm -hmm. to make it unthinkable. Mm -hmm. But we must, you, you said at the beginning, it's a moral issue. We have a duty to protect the over 2,300 yes. children who lose their lives every day in the United States, mm -hmm. we must have laws in place to say that you cannot take an innocent human being's life and show yeah. the personhood of these children, which our heartbeat legislation does so beautifully, shows the personhood. Mm -hmm. if, if it, Hopefully with the Dobbs case, it yeah. will be allowed yeah. to, to go into effect. But, but really engaging politically is so important. And I would even say and challenge people if they are a part of a faith-based community, Christian, Jewish, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, to engage their faith leaders and say, this is something we cannot be silent on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One in four women will have had an abortion before they're 45. That means hurting men and women in the pews that need yeah. to hear a message, there's mm -hmm. hope, love, and forgiveness. Mm -hmm but there's a whole young community that's been lied to saying it's legal so it's okay, it's mm -hmm. a clump of cells. They need to hear from that same faith leader. This is a distinct human being made yeah. in the image of God. This is, yes, is it a political issue? It is, but so was slavery. Mm -hmm. But this is also an issue yeah. that scientifically and faith-wise that we have a responsibility and a duty, mm -hmm. like, like you were saying, Rachel, to protect our most vulnerable who have no voice. So I would really challenge people and say, there is a way for everyone to be involved, but my heart is the political side because we must make abortion mm -hmm. illegal. Yeah. I do want to ask one question. Yeah. Um, how do we spread the word to women who uh, are pro-choice and they believe that our position is anti-feminist? How do we tell them that this is about the women and how do we spread that? And how do we get them over to being pro, pro life? That's a great question. That's a fantastic question. I love that question. <laughs> um, I think, I think there are a few different answers. I think one is, um, like specifically, like if you may have a pro-abortion friend, mm -hmm. um, take them out to coffee, hear their heart, hear, hear why they believe that side. And then also start to share about who the pro-life movement is and what the pro-life movement does because I think that there's so many misconceptions mm -hmm. about what the pro-life movement does. I think something else is um, maybe even have your pro-choice, pro-abortion friend um, go and tour a pregnancy crisis center and she can come and she can see truly that these pregnancy crisis centers, that, that they are there equally for that preborn child, of course, but they're also for that woman equally, um, and to share about how the pregnancy crisis centers, how they walk alongside of these women. Um, I think also um, maybe if she could hear about some of the testimonies of women who they have chosen life, um, and, them, and them also just sharing their story of how they really felt loved by the pro-life community. So I think that first off, it's hearing where that, like, why that person believes what they believe, um, and then also kind of just changing some of the narrative of where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And I would I would add to that because that's such an outstanding question because that that really is the question. It really yeah. is Bailey. Sure. And honestly, I I often say this to my friends on the on the pro abortion side that abortion is not empowering to women. Mm -hmm. It is actually the opposite of feminism. Yeah. I'm all for women's rights and women's equality. And that's actually a major reason to not support abortion because women yes. leave the abortion clinic unempowered, yeah. 
powerless. Broken. Exactly. So there is nothing that lines up with the feminist narrative. And actually, as a woman, can I say this? And I've said this to pro-abortion friends. Mm -hmm. As a woman, that I could call myself a feminist, actually, mm -hmm. I would say it is insulting to me mm -hmm. to be told that I can't pursue my dreams while being pregnant, that I can't accomplish all mm -hmm. the goals that I want to accomplish yes, right. and still take care of a child. Are you kidding? We are made for multitasking. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is what women are made for. This is what we do well. We could have a hundred <laughs> things we're juggling in the air. So it's insulting to me and it goes against the feminist narrative to say, sorry, you better get rid of your baby because you won't be able mm -hmm. to have your dreams. But that's not true. Yeah. You you got a partner in crime with you to have yeah, your right. dreams and yeah. more. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, the next question I want to ask, and, and I'll tell you my opinion, is to me, all human life is equal and needs to be protected and has dignity. Thank you. And Thank you. what would you tell a, a uh, woman who, and a, a, a husband and wife or couple who just determined that they were going to have an autistic child or, or a child that in some way uh, had a genetic disorder and they were having to decide whether or not they were going to abort that child. What, what discussion would you encourage that person to have and to consider? Well, you know, Jake, you're asking the question that is so near and dear to Peter in my heart mm -hmm. and obviously to Rachel's too because mm -hmm. she went from being in the doctor's eyes a a child worth taking care of, seeing two patients in the minute mm -hmm. we ran into trouble and she was sick in utero, even though not all the things she said, they said, but she was still sick. All of a sudden, they made her seem like she was disposable, mm -hmm. like she was less than. And I would say to parents, first of all, choose your doctors carefully. Make sure you have doctors. I, Pete and I thought all doctors valued all life. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. But the other thing that I would say is that child, healthy, not healthy, they have not lost their value. Sometimes I give this analogy. I say, imagine if you had a child who was two or three years old, and all of a sudden that poor child got a horrible cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Your love for that child, your bandwidth to fight for that child would not change. Yeah. But all of a sudden, the discussion changes just because of the location of the child. Mm -hmm. well, and yes, this is a kitchen table conversation, yeah. and that's our dog in the background. I'm wondering if we Elsie can wants it over. a seat at the table. Okay, <laughs> she's on. giving her two cents. <laughs> this is what yeah. happens when we do yeah. real life at the kitchen right. table. Okay, but, um, can you? Okay, I'm trying to get I it. I would see the parents. So that, yes, barking is in the background. background. <laughs> no one ever regrets fighting for their child in the same way that a parent would fight for their child if their child had a bad diagnosis outside of the womb is the same love that we want to give and the same dignity that that child within the womb deserves and even if yes it's a diagnosis that is true that that child has that struggle you know on after they're born for the rest of their lives None of us this side of eternity is exempt from struggles. Mm -hmm. For some of us, it's physical. For some of us, it's emotional. For some, I mean, mm -hmm. nobody this side of eternity, if we started saying mm -hmm. your life should be cut short because you might struggle, none of us would yeah, be here. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. has something exactly. they're dealing with this side of eternity. Mm -hmm. But that child is a gift from God, is no accident. Mm -hmm. And there's a purpose and a plan for every human being, whether they fit inside the box or whether they don't, whether healthy or sick, no matter how long they live or don't live, that child is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And parents can have peace of mind when they fight for their child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Rachel, you're That's the manifestation good. of it. So <laughs> you, you can speak on it as, as well as anybody. So sweet. Well, I'd say ditto to everything that you said. I think also, I think it's that, I think it's that recognition biblically going back to it, where I think about in Genesis 126, in summary, where God talks about how he made us in his image. And I mean, to contemplate the reality of how significant and how beautiful that is, we can't even comprehend that. But I think also, also to the, to, to the quote contrary, to think to myself that we live in a land 
um, and, and that also just seeing the broken medical community by so many that believes mm -hmm. that believes that somehow the narrative that somebody isn't made in God's image if X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. just, just the excuses that are consistently made. And I would share with the parents, I would say, God loves you, God loves your baby. He gave you this child for a beautiful, significant purpose. I would also say something that I think is beautiful is I think that oftentimes a child that may be diagnosed with a disability, I think to myself, well, two things. I think to myself, the curious thing that strikes me is when you see children who are outside the room have a, who have a disability, society champions them to see their ability within their disability but yet a child who's inside the womb, they're somehow demonized and considered not worthy of being championed because of their disability. So it's just heartbreaking the two different narratives. And I think also though, I think that a child who has a disability can teach our society lessons that we cannot even comprehend. Mm -hmm. I think about precious children who have Down syndrome and the joy that people exude who have Down syndrome is beyond what we can comprehend. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, the joy of Jesus that naturally flows from people who have Down syndrome that spreads to our world. Mm -hmm. But I also am heartbroken by the, I want to say it's 90% of children who are diagnosed to have Down syndrome are aborted. Mm -hmm. The amount of joy that we've lost in our world. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's also, it's really rechanging that mindset to see children who have disabilities are beautiful, mm -hmm. are incredible. All of us are made for a purpose and for a plan and to really champion that child, champion the disability that they do have to show that mm -hmm. God made them mm -hmm. that way for a beautiful purpose. And I think that also that it takes away from that box narrative that our society has because it's saying God doesn't live in some box. He doesn't have yeah. a box. Um, and God wants to express his love and his heart through all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when we're taking away the lives of children with disabilities, we are taking away his love that he wants to show us in a really significant, beautiful way. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's beautiful and beautifully said, too. Uh, the, the last question I'll have, and, uh, and I'll let you guys close, is about a, the nuclear family. I've, I've made mm -hmm. a, a front and center issue in my campaign about the importance of maintaining a nuclear family. And if you look at Absolutely. the number one indicator for success for, for children long term is uh, do they have a dual parent household mm -hmm. and, and protecting yes. that entity because yes. that's what it, American culture is all about. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a very sanctified um, part of what being uniquely American is and making mm -hmm. sure we're raising our children in a very responsible, thoughtful way. Um, but I also think that comes into what you guys said earlier about the life issue, mm -hmm. which is we can't let our females feel abandoned or alone because that's when they're going to be more likely yeah. uh, to abort a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, so Absolutely. So how, how can we get back to, number one, protecting the values, the Christian values this country was based on, which includes protecting the nuclear family to ensure mm -hmm. that we've got um, a very, very strong household that allows our future generations to be successful mm -hmm. and prosperous. Uh, you know, that that is so at the foundation of the life issue, Jake. Thank you for acknowledging that and saying that. And honestly, I, I think it, it's sad to say, but culturally and so often the media being so biased with a mm -hmm. liberal narrative mm -hmm. that we need to stop demonizing the sanctity of marriage. We need to stop demonizing the family unit. This is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And this is something that should be embraced mm -hmm. and nurtured and not talked about in a way mm -hmm. that it is somehow mm -hmm. less than. Mm -hmm. And we've strayed so far from our Christian Judeo roots, mm -hmm. so far that it is profoundly dangerous. And, and I think one of the things we can say is, you look at all the struggles and troubles that we have in this world and so much of it is because we have strayed from what is foundational which is the family unit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i used to do prison ministry rachel did it for a little while yeah. and and something that anybody who will tell you that's gone into the prison mm -hmm. systems is so much of the pain and suffering and and the unfortunate choices 
have been based on a fatherless home. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And dads matter. Mm -hmm. yes. Marriage matters. Yes. I, I also think as people of faith, we can do a better job of having support systems for marriages mm -hmm. and for families. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all human. None of us yeah. is perfect. We need people to come alongside of us, but we need mm -hmm. people to champion the beauty of marriage and not so minimize it as if, oh, you're having trouble, you know, just get a divorce. And, and yeah. we need to change that narrative to, Everybody has trouble. When you get yeah, two yeah. human beings yeah, together right. with their mm -hmm. own wills, there's, yeah. but that doesn't mean that yeah. you can't get on the other side of the mountain. But I think we need to do a better job supporting one another and stop demonizing that which is precious mm -hmm. in the eyes of God and changes the fabric of our culture to make us stronger when we have strong mm -hmm. families. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree with yeah. that. No, I think that's right. And how are we on time? Well, what I'll do is I'll close it out, and I thank you guys. This was a beautiful discussion. Mm -hmm. it, it means a great deal to both Bailey and me that oh, you guys did this. And, so uh, it we, means so much to us. Yeah. We're so humbled. Yeah, well, it, it was fantastic, and I think everything you guys said is exactly right. We, we are at a crossroads in our country. I think we are deviating further and further from the values and principles that America is based on, and we've got to have uh, unafraid leaders to get us back on track and at the heart of it. It is getting back to the Judeo-Christian values that the country is based on, getting back to protecting the sanctity of human life, which That's is right. it's not a sexy topic anymore, unfortunately, uh, but it should be because uh, it is, like you said earlier, Suzanne, one of the, the number one human rights mm -hmm. crisis of um, in my generation. Yes. Yes. Um, Absolutely. And so I want you guys to know I will fight relentlessly <laughs> to make sure that abortion is completely and totally illegal in this country. Mm -hmm. Make sure that any federal funded abortion clinics have no funding and that's eradicated and you guys have my word and I'll fight to the bitter end for it. Uh, so with that, I thank all of you guys for joining us today. This was a beautiful discussion. Uh, Suzanne and Rachel, two of my dearest friends and we appreciate them inviting in, us into their home in East Cobb to share our message and their testimony with us. And we hope that you guys will join us again soon. Mm -hmm.